My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. Since we can't explain these events and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, we've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident 1. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common. Duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal, but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident 2. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes, shoes that were worn out as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident three. This one is hard to believe, and trust me, I know. I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake and I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall, while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught, in my peripheral vision, a humanoid-type being. I used peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head, no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful, but at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. 
We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window, so we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, bats, and I'm not kidding, began to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. This was completely terrifying. As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening, and I know that's not normal. So, we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods walk in the tree line and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east to northeast. I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell it kind of sounds like a symbol. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked, though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property, and this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared, and as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening, and we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming. So overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know.
I haven't really had a ton of encounters that I can't explain, but one kind of sticks with me from about a year ago. Last December, I was visiting my family who lives in Poland for the holidays, just some traditional stuff. A couple of days before Christmas, I decided to take a walk in the forest that I used to play in when I was little. There wasn't much going on for the rest of that particular day. It was in the late afternoon, and it was pretty foggy, with overcast skies. The temperature was around 5 degrees Celsius. When I entered the forest, it was normal. I could hear birds chirping and other small animals moving around. About 15 minutes later, it suddenly got really cold. The forest went quiet, and I could see my own breath. I was confused, so I checked the weather app on my phone to see if the temperatures matched up. But my phone said it was still 5 degrees, which didn't make any sense, because I could see my breath and my teeth were chattering. Then, when I turned my phone off, I saw my reflection in the screen, but standing behind me was a white figure. I didn't get a great look before I jumped and quickly turned around to find nothing behind me. It scared the shit out of me, so I started running back the way I came. As I ran, I looked back to see the figure calmly walking toward me. Only then did I get a good look at her. It looked like a girl, probably in her late teens or early twenties. She had mid-length curly dark hair and wore a dress that looked like it was from the early 1900s era. It didn't look like she had any eyes, just dark holes where the eyes should have been. This scared me even more, so I picked up my pace and ran full speed out of the woods and back to my uncle's house. As I exited the forest, I felt the temperature gradually return to normal. When I entered the house, I was out of breath. None of my family members were home except for my aunt, who was in the other room watching television. I never told them, or anyone, about what happened. I've tried finding a logical explanation for it all, but I just can't. I was always skeptical about ghosts, but I am a superstitious person, especially when it comes to demons or folklore. If anyone knows more about the paranormal than I do, and you know what the hell that thing was, please let me know. This experience has left me feeling extremely shaken, and I would love some opinions, especially from somebody with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in a national forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam and they're free of charge. A trade-off for sketchy and rough drives into the park sometimes, and a lack of service and assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up a mountain, around maybe 5 p.m. It was very nice out, sunny, and warm with a slight breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling did not let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it, for as long as I could, before my phone completely lost service. I was looking for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but I didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog to look over the edge, and I noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yucca, my dog, started to growl slightly. She is vocal, but I have almost only ever seen or heard her growl at or with other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelled, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself on being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more and more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one's going to be driving more than 5 to 10 miles per hour up this thing 
and that's if there's even anybody out there. I hear men's voices. They sound close, and I think that I should call out to them, so I stop my car. But then I kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're saying. I don't see any sign of people anywhere. I get back in my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be coming from. I've never run into other people in a national park or forest when I've gone in this deep. The unsettling feeling grows about these voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't even remember how Yucca was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. A bit dangerously fast for the road, I went back down the mountain not seeing any sign of anybody. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself, and the voices could have been echoing from somewhere far off and they just sounded close. Animals die. Glass gets broken. Nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to the feeling I had driving up that mountain. And it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information, as well as some Native American lore, that made me feel extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I have mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes that it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the national park ones and didn't see anything, but I didn't look much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination with this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left, and the sun had set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from the No Sleep podcast to the X-Files and ended up on a true story video dealing with Native American lore. I'm half paying attention, petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Wendigos. Very briefly says what they are, and casually mentions that they can mimic voices. I mean it when I say the most horrible chills I've ever had in my life crawled down my spine. I stare at my boyfriend and I ask him if he remembers that national forest that I was freaked out about last year. He says he does, and he reminds me that he texted me that I was probably close to a Wendigo. I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and I thought he was just being funny like, haha, yeah, Bigfoot is stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no, I mean, I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you could find no trace of. I started to feel super strange, and I began googling Wendigos and things like that. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there is a ton of questionable information out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another Family Goes Missing in Mendocino. I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing, but they're all a little bit hidden underneath national park websites and pictures of trees. I remembered looking up the forest about a year ago, but I didn't see anything. And I realized that these stories didn't seem to be talked about very much, which also piqued my intuition and interest. It was stated that well over 100 people in the past eight years have gone missing and not been found out there, on top of the many which are found dead. It just has my interest super spiked, remembering how unsafe I felt, how badly I wanted to get out of there terrifies me, and I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing, and I do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following one day, and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica, so her little growls along the way make me feel like there was something wrong. 
Even though it was just a storytelling video, these stories originate from somewhere, right? I had an interesting experience while camping with my husband a couple of weeks ago. It was a nice drive in a campsite, a corner spot next to one of the other campsite and woods on the other three sides. We had a nice day hiking and cooked some fajitas and s'mores over the fire, and then we settled into our tent to sleep. Later that night, I woke up and heard a weird noise. It sounded kind of like an electronic tone, and then I heard what sounded like people talking right outside of the tent. They better get out of that tent. I saw a possum go in there. Thinking that there must be other campers walking around, I turned over and tried to go back to sleep. A couple minutes later, I heard a strange noise again, the same one, and then what sounded like a cat meowing and walking around the tent. It sounds like my cat when he wants to be let into the house. Now I'm not about to let strange animals into my tent, so I just laid there and it stopped after about a minute. A couple of minutes later I heard the tone once again, and then I heard a lower, gravelly voice talking outside the tent. They better get out of there, before I get them. All of this happened over the course of maybe ten minutes. I didn't react as strongly as I probably should have, but I was tired and thought at first that it might be some kind of dream. My husband got up and left the tent to use the bathroom a little while later. He hadn't heard anything, and I didn't hear anything else after that. The next morning, while eating breakfast, I could hear the neighboring campers talking. One of their children, about five to seven years old, was upset with his brother because they'd clearly heard somebody telling them to get out of the camper last night. He was arguing with his brother, who was vehemently denying that he had heard anything at all. I'm not sure what exactly happened that night but it was interesting. This story takes place in North Italy, back in 2014. It was early September. A friend of mine suggested that we take a short hike in the woods near his town and obviously I agreed, since I love hiking in nature. We prepared our backpacks, grabbed some food, and drove out to the place. My friend knew the area very well, so we didn't take a map. We didn't have any flashlights either, since we had planned to return to the car in just a few hours. And in early September, daylight lasts a pretty long time. As we got deeper into the woods, we saw a lot of beautiful things rivers, a pair of caves that we explored. We had lunch and proceeded to follow a trail into a deeply wooded area. After around a half an hour, at that point we were about 50 minutes away from the car, we arrived to a pretty large clearing. In that clearing, there were four to five people, normally dressed. They were simply talking and laughing. No satanic cults or dreadful chants or praying in circles or anything like that just super ordinary people, like my friend and I, talking to each other. They obviously saw us too, since the clearing had no trees or rocks to cover the views and we couldn't avoid that. As we approached them, we just said, hey there, what's up? They didn't answer back, and they just started to stare at us, without saying a single word. Obviously this was a huge red flag. We stopped too, and I looked over to my friend, he looked back at me, concerned. We again said, Hey! No answers. I've started to feel uneasy, so we decided to return back to the car. Soon after we moved back, though, we realized that they started to follow us. As we noticed that, we yelled, Hey, why are you following us? Did we do something wrong? Yeah, we were pretty young and dumb. In those kinds of situations, it's often the best thing to just run immediately out of there, but we thought we would try to be nice. No answer. Obviously we proceeded to walk faster, and we tried to go off the trail, another pretty dumb choice. But again, my friend knew the area well. But no matter what we did, they were always around, 
at about 15 meters distance. We started to panic, so we looked to each other again and agreed to get out of there as quickly as possible. As soon as we started running, we could hear behind us that they began running too. This obviously made us freak out even more. We did our best to put distance between us and them. Another thing that made me panic was, like I said, we were about 50 minutes away from the car. We were in a very isolated area, so I thought our situation was hopeless. At a certain point, when we were about halfway back, we started to notice that they weren't behind us anymore. We thought that maybe, and luckily, we had managed to lose them. The area, like I said, is pretty heavily wooded and has plenty of slopes, so it's easy to get lost if you're not used to it. Plus, we took an off trailway that my friend knew. We hid behind a thick bush and tried to listen. Silence. No footsteps. No voices. Although, even when they were following us, they didn't say a single word. So, we took our breath and managed to return to the car, trying our best to be as silent as possible. We jumped in the car and raced the hell out of there. But it doesn't end there. As we left the woods on the main road, we saw coming from a secondary road another car behind us. They were following us again, and they surely never lost our tracks while we were returning to the car. We're very sure that they were the same people, because one, they were basically tailgating us. Two, the area is very rarely visited, and there were absolutely no cars in the parking lot except for my friends. And three, their car had no plates. We drove to my friend's town, avoiding going to his house, taking every country road, and every turn we made, they did as well. As we reached the town's ingress, they made a U-turn and returned back to the woods direction. We were fucking terrified, and we immediately called the police and informed the people that were in the small town square as they approached us. My friend and I were basically crying as we got out of the car. We checked the area out, but no evidence of activity came up in the following hours. They never showed up anymore in the following days, but we became paranoid for some weeks to even get out of our houses. This is why I took a break from hiking for about four years. I have no idea who they were and why they acted like this, but that experience nearly gave me PTSD. It's been completely terrifying, and it still affects me to this day. I was with my niece, who's on her high school soccer team, and is taking it pretty seriously, and attempting to get some kind of scholarship out of it. I'm pretty healthy, and I don't really work out too much, but something I often do is run and hike. I live in Kentucky, not in a rural part, but there's a state park near my house that's 6,500 acres, so it's pretty secluded and densely wooded. There are some really nice trails that allow you to run for a good chunk and then hike for a bit to split up the long bits of the trail that are flat. She decided to tag along with me today for a quick three to four mile run. It was raining, but nothing too heavy. Kind of a spitting rain. Nothing we can't handle. We got up to the peak of this one hill, and it had been about two miles or so, according to our phones. So we decided to turn back and head back to the car. As we were headed down the steep side of the climb, we were walking pretty slowly, just to make sure we didn't slip and lose our footing, when out of nowhere, there was the coldest chill that came from behind us once we made it about halfway down. At the time it happened, we both commented on how cold it was, but we didn't make too much out of it, and just went on with our conversation. In these woods, there are some wildlife, like small deer and maybe some coyotes, but they tend to stay away from the paths. At least I have only heard them in my many years of coming here. Never once have I seen anything more than a few tracks. Once we got off the hillside and hit a stretch of the trail that was flatter ground, we began to pick up the pace when a deer darted across the path, maybe ten yards in front of us, causing us to stop in our tracks. The first deer was then followed by three more, and not one of them even so much as looked in our direction. My niece looked at me, puzzled because of the oddity of it. 
to me, they acted like they were running from something. A predator of some kind. Once they'd gone, we started back with our run, and we heard a noise behind us. A loud, booming noise of something of substance falling to the ground from some height. When we stopped and turned, we saw nothing. No animals scurrying away like one would expect after a substantial noise in the wilderness. In fact, everything was eerily calm. Just as we looked at each other to ask what the actual hell that was, there was yet another cold wind gush through the valley, pushing all the rain off the leaves surrounding us, soaking our sweatshirts. Internally, I started to freak out, but I was doing my best to stay calm for my 17-year-old niece, but I'm pretty sure she could tell that I was freaked out. I tell her, come on, let's get to the car, and we turn to take off again, and there was a man leaned up against a tree on the side of the trail dressed in a black suit with a white button-up shirt. His collar was open, but he had a tie on, sagging like a tired businessman on the way home from a long day. It startled me at first. I wasn't expecting to see anybody out there for a few reasons. One is that we were at the very least a mile away from any parking lot or street. Another being that we never heard or saw him coming. And the stretch of trail we were on was flat and open for a good half a mile. I got over to put myself between the man and my niece as we jogged past him. When we did, I looked him in the eye and gave him a how you doin' nod as we went along. He was sort of pale. His eyes were very white, but his irises were ice blue. Everything that I saw from the quick look I got up close looked to be clean cut and proper. I didn't notice a speck of mud anywhere on him, and the two of us had it caked on the bottom of our shoes, and even on the backs of our pants and shirts from kicking it up as we ran. We had to get to the top of another hill, smaller than the last, but still quite the hike up. Once on top, I took a quick look behind us, and he had seemed to vanish without a trace. Now with having the vantage point of the hill, I could see out past the trail, and see most of the hill that she and I had just come from, and yet he was nowhere in sight. I scanned off the sides of the trail, and still nothing. My niece asked me who that guy was, and why he was out so deep in the woods wearing a suit, questions I simply didn't have the answers to. We made it back to the car with nothing else out of the ordinary happening to us on the trail. As we came to my car, I pulled the keys from my pocket, and unlocked the doors from maybe ten feet out. Walking up to the only car in the entire lot, I noticed muddy footprints coming away from my car door from the driver's side. Weird, considering I had no mud on my shoes when we got there. But there are trails leading up to the lot, so I figured maybe somebody came through before we got there and I just never noticed. However, when I pulled the handle to open the door, the handle was caked with mud underneath, almost like somebody was attempting to open my door with a muddy hand. Nothing more happened, but the entire encounter leaves chills covering my body the more I think about it. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died, and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. 
He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid 70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. 
They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk. Items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with him outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I'm one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but I hope you all find the story as fascinating as I do. A few years ago, my friends and I went on a 45-mile, three-night kayaking trip down the Green River in Kentucky. It runs above the Mammoth Cave System, the world's longest known cave system, with more than 400 miles of surveyed passageways. We brought everything we needed in our kayaks and one canoe, food, tents, water filtration, etc and we camped each night on the riverbank when it started getting dark, and we found level enough ground most times. The first night was uneventful, except to say that there's nothing like a wall of fireflies against a mountainous black tree line at night in the middle of nowhere. The second day, around sunset, after a long day of kayaking and baking in the July heat, we came upon a stream on the bank that opened up into a large ravine. The stream, as we found out, was a cave spring, pouring out blue, freezing cold cave water into a lagoon, about 30 feet wide and so deep the blue water turned black after a few feet. The lagoon had a long, sandy beach, secluded by hills on either side, and a tall, overhanging cliff behind and above us. It was a beautiful, otherworldly place. Time moved very slowly there. We decided to camp there for the night. The sand was soft, white, and very fine, ideal for sleeping. For some reason, the place deeply frightened me, but I didn't speak up. We were all tired and everyone was having fun. We built a small fire, 
and enjoyed the stars through the leaf canopy for a while before everybody went to bed. I slept hard that night. At around 5 a.m., I woke up with an urge to relieve myself. It was still dark. I had the tent door zipper about halfway opened and had just popped my head out when I heard a loud and terrible roar or scream. I immediately cowered back into the tent and zipped it closed, and I waited. The scream came from about 10 feet to my left, near the dwindling fire. It was high-pitched, but not like an owl screech, although I'm not ruling that out. It was a wretched, pained scream that got lower-pitched at the end. Being that we were in the middle of nowhere, Kentucky, most likely it was a fox, or a boar, or some kind of bird. Whatever it was, I lay awake for an hour, listening. I heard absolutely nothing. Granted, we were on a soft beach, but I didn't hear a single twig snap, not a single leaf crinkle, when, whatever it was, finally shuffled away. It was bizarre. I should mention at this time that up the beach and off to the side of the lagoon was a small, dry cave opening maybe three feet wide. I cannot say with any certainty that it was not some ancient cave-dwelling creature that surfaced to investigate our camp. I somehow fell back asleep and awoke the next morning shaken. I asked if any of my friends had heard the terrible scream, but no one had. We pressed on down the Green River. The third night, at dusk, we came upon a large rocky beach. We pulled our boats ashore and decided this would have to do, as we didn't want to go farther down the river and risk being stuck on the water at dark. This rocky beach was where the river split into two, and in the middle formed a collection of pale rocks, tall grass, and dried out wood, a desolate pile of muck the size of a football field. The landmass was covered in jumping sand spiders and tiny frogs. Again, otherworldly. We set up camp, ate, and all went to bed at around the same time. It was silent for probably 20 to 30 minutes, I'm not sure. I was asleep, as the others most likely were as well. I was having a dream, but suddenly, my dream was interrupted by what sounded like a booming, loud, mechanical, wooden beast. I awoke and shot straight up. It was truly the loudest thing I have ever heard. It sounded like a massive bulldozer tearing down a huge steel and wood building. Then came a boom, followed by its echo throughout the river valley. The animals shifted and the birds flew away. We were all awoken by the crash and yelling and confusion to each other in our tents. Nothing but silence followed outside our tents, and nobody was particularly willing to shine a flashlight toward the woods. Eventually, we all just decided that it was a falling tree, and went back to sleep. The next morning, I thought about it some more. It didn't sound like just a falling tree. I must stress that it had a metallic quality, and it was projected purposefully. It almost sounded like a roar. In the morning light, we found no evidence of anything out of the ordinary, nor any obvious fallen trees that could have made such a loud sound. So we packed up and headed out onto the river, one last time, to head home. My friends and I still talk about that trip and all the weird things that happened. We did the same kayak trip a couple of years later, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. No mysterious forest noises, no crashing, no metallic groaning in the middle of the night, nothing. To both my disappointment and relief. I live in the suburbs of Dublin, Ireland, where I'm surrounded by greenery, beautiful hiking trails, and lots of Celtic mysticism. One particular hiking trail is called the Hellfire Club. There's a lot of stories that have been passed on from generation to generation as to where it got the name, but the most popular, as far as I'm aware, is that on top of the mountain where the trail passes, 
is an old, completely deteriorated stone house. Legend has it that back in the day, it was a hangout spot where men would drink, play cards, and have a merry old time. One night, a group of men were playing cards, and a stranger asked if he could join in. During the game, one of the men dropped a card, bent down to pick it up off the ground, and realized the stranger that had joined them had hoofed feet. So, present day, this trail is very popular for hikers and campers. This particular day, three friends decided to go camping and set up tent beside an old hunting lodge. After a few hours, they noticed that someone had set up camp quite close by. Not weird, but maybe a little odd. This guy decided to approach the three campers and introduce himself, and ended up chatting with them for a few hours. After some time had passed, one of the campers decided that they needed more firewood. The stranger went with him and the other two went off in another direction. As the camper was about to get firewood, he was grabbed from behind by the stranger, who put his left hand across his mouth and attempted to cut his throat with the knife. He was sliced across the throat three times before he managed to push the attacker away. He fell to the ground and was then stabbed in the chest. The knife broke, leaving the blade embedded in his chest. The other two realized something was happening and tried to intervene, one being knocked to the ground and the other escaping to go get help. The cops were called and went searching for the guy who they eventually found. It turned out that he had recently spent a lot of time in a mental institution, suffered from a deep-seated mental illness, paranoid schizophrenia, and he had had an acute psychotic episode that day. As far as I know, he got locked up for a few years, but this happened about 10 minutes away from my house. Horror movies come to life. I don't know if these two events are connected, but people say the Hellfire Club in that area, which also happens to be where these people were camping, is cursed. My husband and I really enjoy outdoor sports, especially camping. We sometimes go camping in forbidden zones, too. But we really do take care of the place we're staying, always cleaning up our mess and trying to leave it the way we found it. This happened during one of the times we were camping in a forbidden zone. We now call it the Fairy Forest. The forest is owned by a family that did a hell of a good job at decorating the place. Figures of fairies, elves, and angels were scattered around the brown fall leaves on branches and rocks. Dream catchers and other handmade artifacts, presumably made by children, were also hanging around the place. There were also little tables and chairs designed for the fairies and info tables explaining about the fairies and elves. It was truly a fairy tale. There was one problem, though. Some douchebags threw things and broke some of the decorations. So we put them back up and mended what we could, and then we walked along. We set up our tent, cooked some food, enjoyed our drinks, and just chilled before going to bed. I woke up to three or four lights hovering over me at night. I wasn't scared, I was just surprised. I didn't want to open my eyes in case the lights disappeared. I wanted to prolong the experience as much as I could, but I soon drifted back to sleep. The morning sun penetrating our tent woke us up. As we were pouring our morning coffee, I casually told my husband that I saw lights hovering over us at night. He paused for a second and then said, I saw them too. We got into a heated discussion as to what they could have been. No, our overhead lamp could not have malfunctioned, because the lights were moving, almost swimming in the air, if you will. No, they could not have been people shining flashlights at us, because we didn't hear any footsteps, and the source of the lights were coming directly from our tent right above us. They were like balls of light, or orbs, not like rays. 
No, they couldn't have been airplane lights or any other street lights, because again, the lights that we saw were moving. We believe that they were fairies, possibly thanking us for cleaning up the mess. We still go there from time to time, just to drink coffee, but we haven't camped there since. I always sense this amazing feeling each time I go there. That forest melts away my problems and gives me a content feeling, almost like it's telling me that everything's going to be okay. And it's absolutely beautiful. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma. My playground, the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I loved that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike there than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and ridden nearly every road. Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had ridden out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs. As the name suggests, they have live buffalo roaming and there's a large spring and fountain for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek and then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to see by was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what had just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounding like something hitting the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock, about the size of a baseball, rolling across the trail. Me being confused, I looked up the side of the hill. Just as I turned to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down, hitting my front wheel. I finally get my eyes to adjust to look and see someone very tall and dark and covered in hair at the top of the hill, throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled that I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. For obvious reasons, I lit up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek. I saw that it was a huge rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew there about what happened. He said, so you're telling me you were attacked by Bigfoot. He started snidely laughing. I said, listen, I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. The ranger just laughed. Okay, Justin, if we have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I said fine and left. The very next week, I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and told me to get in. I asked him why, and he said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I owe you a huge apology. I'll be honest, I didn't believe you when you told me the story of how you were attacked, but it's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night and they were attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. They called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, myself included. I immediately thought about what you told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud, had long hair and a large beard. Turns out he had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, in his mind, he thought he was back in Vietnam and he was trying to, quote, take out the enemy. 
The park ranger said that I was very lucky, because while he wasn't Bigfoot, he was trying to kill me. We went inside so I could give the police my statements as to what had happened. They had to send him somewhere to a more secure facility, and to this day, I still get shivers when I hike that trail, and I always keep my eyes on the ridgetop. I definitely feel bad for the guy. That was also one of the scariest things I've ever experienced in the backwoods. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place that Dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the pines that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s, and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him suddenly disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forestry to camp, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated. But the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. On a trip when I was a teenager, it got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us all out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy, slumped against a log, hat over his face, taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural, uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we would stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt back roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best and dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious as heck about what was going on out there. So, a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual. My mates jumped out of the car, but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut was to get out, but I'd spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, 
quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like somebody could be back at any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then, my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock. Tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off. I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way that anything good had come from having children's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, but he just shook it off, saying that weird stuff happens out there all the time. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father ever again. My mother and father divorced when I was eight. I lived with my father until late 1995. I was 13 when I moved in with my mother. But in 2002, I had a falling out with my stepfather and ended up moving in with my father. My father lived in the country while my mother lived in a small town. My father's home was surrounded by a forest with few neighbors situated on a hill. When I was a child, I used to walk through the woods so I knew them really well. In 2004, my father's home burned to the ground and we left the area, moving into a small town and living in an apartment. I ended up in college studying film and I was tasked with making a film, of course. I decided to shoot a short film about a serial killer stalking campers in the woods because apparently I was really unoriginal at the time. So, me and my two friends, Adam and Zach, were looking for locations. I figured the forest where I used to live would be perfect because it was in the middle of nowhere and there would be no sounds. So, we did what you normally do, scout locations. One for the campsite and routes that the protagonist and antagonist would take through the forest. We arrived and were deep in the woods, as this time only one person still lived in the area and he wasn't home nor did he own all the land, so we stayed well clear of his land. As we were moving through the forest, trying to find the perfect clearing, all was quiet, which was startling, because though we were deep in the woods, the sounds of birds and bugs were kind of a normal thing. It was in the afternoon, so there really wasn't any reason for the forest to be silent. We came across a clearing that I knew well, but it was different. When I was a child, deep in the forest there was an old wooden structure. It was flat, and we called it the stage because that's what it looked like. It was in a clearing, right next to a tree line with a wide field that could fit hundreds of people there for a concert. Whether that's what it was, or it was something as simple as the floor of an old shack, I don't know. All I know was when I had gotten there, there was a camper, and someone built a pond right in the middle of the clearing. We decided that clearly somebody was using the space, so it would be best to find a different spot. 
We went to the tree line and descended down a steep hill to a creek. All the while, talking to ourselves about how weird the silence was. If you live in or around a forest, you hear wildlife all the time. The lack of it in such a dense area was strange. We crossed the creek and made our way through fallen trees and large rocks until we found ourselves in a very wooded area. Adam had noticed first and pointed to a grouping of trees that made a perfect circle. Under the dead leaves lay stones, arranged in a circle, and in the center was broken bottles. I walked over to it and ended up tripping. I braced myself with my forearm and deeply cut it on a broken bottle. As I stood up, the silence was broken by a loud scream. It sounded human, female, but it was a scream. I turned to where I thought it came from, and beyond the trees, in the brush, I saw something red run off. We decided to head back. As we came back to the stage and pond area, a truck pulled up. The guy that was the only person living in the area ordered us into his truck to take us out of the area. He said that he owned all that area and that we were trespassing. He knew me, so he didn't give me a hard time or threaten me. He dropped us off, and I asked him how he had known we were there. I didn't, he said. I just heard some scream and thought some idiot fell in the pond. I ended up with stitches in my arm after going to the ER. I only have two plausible explanations for that scream. First is that we didn't know what was beyond the brush. It could have been a home and maybe kids were playing. While the scream was loud and I saw something bright red running, we could have startled someone. But the problem with that theory is that the guy who came in the truck heard it too. And we were far enough away from where he lived to where he would have a hard time hearing it. The only other one is that the scream had come from behind us and because of the trees, sound echoing made me think it was in front of us. This might account for how the guy had heard it too. His home is halfway to the stage area, which is why he was able to get there so fast. But that doesn't account for the red thing I saw, or what the scream was in the first place. And no, I don't think it was a fox or anything like that. I've spent enough time in the woods to know what those sound like. And the red that I saw wasn't like that of a fox. It was bright red, like dyed fabric. I still am completely unable to explain this. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things I learned from scouts and the lessons it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, which was just a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were just leaders with flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everybody should return to camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided it would be funny to try to scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blackout silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making this growling noise. But then the silhouette simply turned around and began to walk away from me. 
They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face-planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front of me. I jogged a bit to catch up with them to make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone, and I didn't really tell anybody until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that that part of the woods had been cut down and the ground heavily churned up by some sort of heavy-duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I've always wondered if the boy and the briefcase were connected. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, Vlad the Impaler, and others. They were all once residing here and fighting battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World Wars had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak magic, or Vlaska magia, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorites was a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest, in a small and old house that was about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if it was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits the house and stays overnight here. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be here. I can't imagine staying here overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very weird story. While he stays there, he gets visited often. At first, I thought visits like the one you get from neighbors or something. But he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling on his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him, using his hand to just crawl across his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair, 
and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time he told me that he used to fix small parts around his house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave with his tractor because it takes about an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't so much as frown. They expect you to react. Do not give them this pleasure, is what he told me while laughing. It makes him go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really runs in our family, experiencing from time to time such encounters. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual stories from the past, how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. Since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motorcycle and drove out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about things, you know? To be in this type of state that you don't have to question everything and think about the world. So one day I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I find myself driving to the old house he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are very widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dusk, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought that I was invincible. In fact, even a vampire wouldn't cross my path that I would ease past with him to no harm. There aren't really any streets there. It's just a dirt road between trees that leads to pretty much nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road starts to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. I thought maybe it was a bug that I had squished it, but it was just too much blood. So I started to look at my hand for wounds, but my hand seemed to be perfectly fine. My heart slowly started racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my entire life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It seemed like somebody was sitting behind me, just waiting for me to fall down or make a mistake. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. I have a ton of stories regarding these kinds of events. Also, we have a few witches in our family that used to practice black magic. It was taught to them by their ancestors. This is a collection of my experiences revolving around the Blue Ridge Parkway. From the summer of 2002 until early 2004, I lived in a small town outside of Asheville, North Carolina. There wasn't much to do in the area on a Friday or Saturday night other than hang out with friends at the movies, go to the bar or pool hall, or, in our case, 
the scenic overlooks on the Blue Ridge Parkway. My group of friends go to meeting spot was one of the two overlooks off of the Blue Ridge Parkway. We would jump on the parkway off of the Tunnel Road, US 70, and drive about three miles north to the Hawk Creek Overlook, park our cars, and depending on the weather, sit outside and just talk the night away. It may sound boring, but those nights were some of the best of my life, filled with laughter and pure joy. It's where we went to decompress from our early 20s stress-filled days. We would usually meet up there any time between 9 to 11 p.m. and not depart until well past 2 a.m., often ending our nights at the nearby Waffle House. Depending on the time of year, the Overlook would get busy with other groups of friends doing the same as us. Romantic dates, nature enthusiasts either camping out in their cars or returning from or embarking on hikes. On certain occasions, Hawk Creek Overlook would be too crowded for our liking, so we would just proceed to the next Overlook, which was Tanbark Ridge. That was almost always nearly empty. It was in these areas that my friends and I experienced truly paranormal and possibly demonic experiences. On most nights, they would come and go without any of the normal events to speak about. That slowly changed. On certain nights, there could be as many as six of us hanging out on the Overlook, other nights only two. On one particular night, and the first Blue Ridge Parkway experience that I can recall, we were standing and talking near the back of my car while we smoked a cigarette, facing the road, the parkway. We were the only car at the second Overlook, Tanbark. When we weren't talking with each other, it would get quieter than quiet up there. The whole night we kept hearing what sounded like conversations or voices coming from the side of the mountain across from where we gathered. It wasn't uncommon for there to be night hikers or campers in the area, but these voices were not coming from an area that was known for trails or camping. As we were standing near the back of my car, we all heard the voices louder than before this time. At first it was from our left, then immediately from our right, and then finally straight in front of us. The voices, although rather loud, were unintelligible. We couldn't make out what they were saying. It was almost like gibberish or some kind of made-up language. We were all expecting to see someone by how close in proximity the voices were, but there was nobody around us. No car had even passed the overlook for a while. We wrote it off as having to be hikers conversing somewhere on the mountain, and their voices somehow carrying or being projected through the woods in some weird acoustical thing. For weeks after, we told the story to our other friends and co-workers, who would all share similar accounts with us. That was the start of many more strange and sinister occurrences. Simultaneously with the strange events that I experienced on the Blue Ridge Parkway, my family and I were also experiencing paranormal activity at the house we were renting in Swananoa. I wondered at the time if the occurrences were related in any way, which as time went on and more events happened, I don't think they were connected at all. The night that I believe triggered a string of events was a Saturday after work. Before heading to the first overlook, I stopped and picked up my friend, and we proceeded to get on the Blue Ridge Parkway. About halfway up from the entrance to the Blue Ridge Parkway and on the first overlook, we noticed a pickup truck three quarters of the way into the woods, off of the road, with only its interior dome light on, and a man returning to the truck with a shovel in his hand. My friend and I instantly got creeped out by this peculiar sight, and half-jokingly both said that the guy was probably hiding a body. Later that night, when we were leaving the Blue Ridge Parkway, I drove past that exact spot where we had seen the truck and the man earlier. I nearly drove off the road as my dome light in my car turned on and nearly blinded me. It's dark on the Blue Ridge Parkway, no lights at all. Almost gave me a heart attack. The light was on for maybe a second or two, and then it shut off. I'm generally a level-headed and rational person, but at that moment I was shook. My friend was equally in shock, and we both calmed ourselves down. When we got to his house, we sat in his driveway and tried to make sense of it. 
That light only turns on if you open a door. We did not open a door. That light had never once turned on for any other reason before that. After I dropped off my friend, I had to drive under the Blue Ridge Parkway bridge on my way back home. As I passed under the bridge, my light again turned on. But this time, it flickered a few times and then stayed off. In my opinion, this was now past the point of coincidence. That was not the last time that my light went off in my truck, for a span of a few months. Not every time, but almost. The light would come on or flicker near that spot on the Blue Ridge Parkway, where we saw the man and his truck. One of my friends who was driving behind me one night saw the light go off from her car, and it scared her so badly that she did not return to the Blue Ridge Parkway at night anymore. On one night, three of us gathered at the first overlook. It had rained a lot the day before and that morning. On the opposite side of the overlook, there was a sheer rock wall that ascended about a hundred feet. There was enough moonlight to see the water trickling down the rock wall. It was my friend that was riding with me when we saw the man that noticed that the water coming down the rock wall appeared to resemble a person's head, tilted sideways. I agreed, and so did our other friend. But as more water ran down, it looked like it formed a rope around the person's neck. And as time went on, more water rolled down, and the person resembled a girl. It was almost too clear, like somebody was purposefully creating this effect. We started to concoct ideas that perhaps that man did do something bad in those woods. And maybe the light flickering and the water on the rocks was a calling of sorts. I had disabled the light in my truck from going off. It still went off a handful of times after that, which should have been impossible. But the cherry on top of it all was on the night that I was the last one of my friends to leave the Overlook. As I drove down to leave the Blue Ridge Parkway, again near that spot, my front driver's side tire blew out. I pulled over on the shoulder of the road and tried to call one of my friends, but I didn't have cell reception. If it wasn't that I had to be at work in the morning, I probably would have just slept in my car until there was light, but that was not an option. I proceeded to get out and change my tire in the pitch black night. I felt so vulnerable, and although nothing happened, I felt as if I wasn't alone. I felt that at any moment, something, I don't know what, would occur to scare the living shit out of me. But nothing did. Until I got back in my car and started pulling back onto the road. At that moment, my light again flickered, and I swear I instantly felt my right side of my body get about 30 degrees colder. The next day, my friend and I called in anonymously to the Asheville PD and reported what we had seen in the woods the truck, and the man. Obviously, we did not mention any of the paranormal events that had occurred after that. We felt as if we had to say something, but for the longest time we weren't sure what or how to. We hadn't heard of any disappearances or murders in the area. But then again, in my early 20s, I wasn't an avid reader of the paper or watcher of the local news. These events all happened around spring to late fall. We stuck to the bars and pool halls for months after those events, until early the following year. We finally decided to venture back to the Blue Ridge Parkway more frequently. My friend and I, the same friend, were starting a new band, and the Blue Ridge Parkway was a great place to collaborate and write songs. One night, and my last night ever spent on the Blue Ridge Parkway, we took up an acoustic guitar to help finish writing a song. That night, both overlooks were crowded, so we drove to this little cut right off the road, just past the first overlook. We settled there and propped open the tailgate of my GMC Jimmy. We were up there for a couple of hours, probably around 1 to 2 in the morning at this point, when we start hearing straight up laughing coming from the woods and the tree line close to the car. We stopped what we were doing and just froze and listened. The laughing stopped and we heard what sounded like a horse snarl, followed by a whisper. We heard a laugh again, and finally, we hear somebody go, Psst. We immediately closed my tailgate, jumped in the car, and drove down to the first overlook. At this point, it had cleared out, and there were no other cars there. I pulled into the overlook with my car still facing the road, 
not pulled into a parking spot. We had no idea what those sounds that we had just heard were or what they'd come from. It just didn't make any sense. At the overlook, my friend got out of the car to relieve himself. We both lit a cigarette and decided to head back to the car as it started to rain a little bit. Just before we got back, we heard what sounded like a gallop or horse hooves getting louder from the area we'd just left. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I had an overwhelming feeling to just get the fuck out of there, and so did my friend. Without saying anything to each other, we ran and jumped into my car to leave. As I turned over the key and started the car, I happened to look back, and that's when I saw an image that to this day I will never forget. I saw what looked like a tall, goat-like man. I distinctly saw horns as it began to run full speed toward the car. I didn't look back again, and I drove like a bat out of hell from that area. My friend didn't look back, but he heard the galloping getting louder and closed his eyes. Neither one of us has ever returned to that area at night again. I moved away from North Carolina in 2004. My friend still lives in the area. However, to this day, he does not go up onto the Blue Ridge Parkway at night. He only visits during the day. When we get together, we can't help but talk about all the shit we saw and experienced during that time. We always talk about one day returning to that area at night again. Even though we're scared to death, the curiosity of the unknown draws me. And we both have questioned why those things occurred to us. And we want answers. So, back in Halloween of the early 2000s, my friends and I were trick-or-treating, as we were only in our freshman or sophomore years of high school. We had taken a walk to a wealthier neighborhood in the hopes that they would have better candy than ours did, and we were supposed to cut through a slightly wooded area into a friend's backyard. My friend Will was leading us through, and he didn't really know the shortcut back. So, we ended up in a very small clearing, just barely still visible from the street. We could still see the street though, so we didn't end up getting lost. The point though, is the house that we found. It was slightly old and definitely abandoned with all of the overgrowth covering it, making it hard to see from the street. We wanted to check it out, as it was Halloween, and we figured we should get a little spooked. We did get spooked, too, when we peeked through the back screen door, and saw a little bit of movement in the pitch black house. But we were already slightly creeped out, so we decided to walk back and take the right shortcut. As we went back, we saw a little bit of movement behind us, and all of us booked it home, being as excitable as we already were. This all happened five months before the actual point of the story occurred. By this time, we had explored the house sealing off the first floor with a door, shower curtain, and weights, as there was some kind of substance in the air that would always make us feel unwell. We made a setup out of the upper floor of the house that we could relax in. We were using it as a spot to hang out, having filled it with battery lamps and chairs as well as sleeping bags for when we would have get-togethers away from our parents for a long time. But as cozy as we made it, the things that we found in the house creeped us out endlessly. The ones I remember the most were the two closets, one with a hook and a rope on the ceiling, and possibly dried blood on the ground. The other closet was filled with plastic on the walls and what we think was also blood. New cleaning supplies were still under the kitchen sink, even though the faucet was removed as well as the oven. There was a functional cotton gin sitting in the empty garage, and a grime-covered knife sitting in the sink. We ignored most of these things, and simply sealed off more rooms that creeped us out. But when we found that knife in the sink, I was worried somebody could use it to attack one of us if they somehow ended up squatting in the hideout we made. 
So I got the genius idea of going to the absolutely filthy brown and black fluid leaking out of the wall's bathroom that no one would ever think to go in and throw the knife in the toilet, which was filled with the same grime and sludge. But when I went in, I failed to notice the door, for some reason, ever so gently closing behind me. And as I was looking around the bathroom for a place to hide the knife, the room got thick and cold except for a slight warmth on my left shoulder, and I was paralyzed. That moment started to feel like hours. Then, ever so quietly and weakly and tiredly, I heard a noise in my left ear, like something that's a cross between a whimper and a dry-throated croak. It seemed filled with more sadness and panic and pleading than I've ever felt in my entire life. I quickly ran out, tossing the knife behind me, and slammed the door shut as hard as I could, feeling a force pull back against me. Then I ran out to my friends who were just outside by the door. We sealed that room up too, and we only went back to clean out our things. We called the police anonymously and the house was searched and a few months later, it was demolished. I'd like to say that although the police searched and apparently found nothing, I concretely believe that a woman, or maybe some poor girl, died in that house. I hope she isn't angry with me. This is a very long story, but it's worth telling, and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia, in a rural town not too far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tingled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door, and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still, nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. 
We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then, it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam. All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick. Too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run. But then, we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not 10 minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and, of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both, once again, terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac, and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called, and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the wood's edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone. Or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom, something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, get in the house, get the F in the house as everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail cam. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up. And to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera.